from his studios in New York. It's time for Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. Here's your host, Dan Tortora. Welcome here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash DT. Hope you're having a phenomenal morning and hope you had a great weekend. Hope you're coming off of a great, great time to relax with the family, with friends, whatever's going on, to just celebrate life. I hope you've been having a great, great time. So my best to each and every single one of you out there. Like I said, I hope your weekend was good. Hope the family's good, hope you're good, hope everybody's good, friends are good, and that you're coming into this morning with newfound energy and strength and all the good stuff. So, God bless and welcome to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Proud to be here with you every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time, right here on MixLR.com backslash Wake Up Call DT. You can become a member for free by going to mixlr.com backslash wakeupcalldt, clicking on follow, and it takes just a couple seconds. Members have the opportunity, once you get your membership, immediately to get emailed every single time the show goes live. So all you have to do is click on your email to listen to the show, and you have the opportunity to chat with me in the live chat room during every live broadcast and give your thoughts and your feelings about the topics we're discussing. We ask for two things. There's two rules. Justify your opinion and be respectful. So if you can be respectful of me, yourself, and other people, and you can justify your opinion, we are good to go. So make sure that you involve yourself in the live chat room by becoming a member today. And I also want to let you know we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at WakeUpCallDT on Facebook, at CallDT on Twitter, and on Instagram, we're at wakeupcall underscore DT. So make sure you check us out on each of those venues. We appreciate the support and all that you do. And thank you so much for being a part of it. So with that being said, it's time to jump into the show the way that we always do every single day. And that is with the morning menu. Here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We like to start off the show by giving you our menu of topics. The morning menu, that is, live now with the morning menu is Dan Tortora. The morning menu right here every single Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. That is the sound that you hear, that beat that gets you bumping in the morning, that beat that makes me feel good in the studio and getting ready to go and rearing for the day. The morning menu every single Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time, right here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. With that being said, today's show, this is what we got on the docket. We're going to start off in this first hour speaking on O'Shea Brissett, his decision to return for year two, that I was never really that concerned about because of our conversations. Multiple conversations, including the one that came after the Sweet 16, where him and I had a little talk about the team and leadership and looking to next season and what his thoughts were on next season. And everything he said to me pointed to, I'm coming back, I'm going to be a leader, we're going to get this thing done, we're going to do this right. So with that being said, I was not that concerned. And I thought it was kind of funny that other people, I shouldn't, well, I shouldn't, well, yeah, I guess funny. I guess funny is the word. That, you know, people were just freaking out about O'Shea Brissett. Anybody that's good on Syracuse, anybody, anybody that makes it happen. I'm surprised that people aren't like, is Marek Dolajai going to leave? But it's, you know, it, it, because he got good toward the end of the season. But it is. You know, O'Shea, pretty good, came in with some hype. Tyus Battle, pretty good, came in with some hype. So everybody's, oh my God, are they going to leave? Are they going to leave? Are they going to leave the team? Oh, what's going to happen? Are they going to leave? Are they going to leave? Are they going to leave like Darius Baisley? Are they not going to be here? I had... I was 90% minimum positive that O'Shea Brissett was coming back next season. And then him and I had a conversation, which I'll play 
in just a little bit here on the show that's in the archive, and it's also tagged on Twitter and Facebook, so you can check it out there, of what he said to me and how he left me with very little confusion about what his plans were for next year and if he was coming back or not. I was not that concerned like other people. So we're going to discuss O'Shea Brissett. And then we're also going to get into live conversations at 10 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time this morning. And the second hour of the show will be filled with Syracuse football now alumni who are moving on and have worked out for other teams and will be working out for the Buffalo Bills this Friday the 13th. Pretty cool, pretty interesting. So they will be on the show in just a little bit. And they're going to be on the show today to discuss what's happening this coming Sunday. So a week from yesterday, something big's happened in the community. Only Wake Up Call is bringing it to you, and we're going to discuss that in just a little bit when we share with Irv Phillips and Zaire Franklin conversation on what we will be doing coming up here very, very soon, and that is going to the Wildcat Sports Pub to provide a live special engagement show for you, the fans, On site, on location, on Sunday, April 15th at 2 p.m., we will be there hanging out with you, just having a good time, meet and greet with Zaire Franklin, Jonathan Thomas, and Irv Phillips, as well as doing a live broadcast on location at the Wildcat. So the guys are going to discuss that with me and their excitement for that. That's going to be coming up in just a little bit here today, so I'm very excited. Very excited about the opportunity to get them onto the show and to discuss what's going on and and just what their thoughts are on this big event that we have coming up this weekend. So at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Irv Phillips will join me. At 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, I will be joined, joined by Zaire Franklin. So Irv Phillips at 10 and Zaire Franklin at 10.30 on today's show, and that will wrap out the broadcast, wrap up the broadcast, I should say. So if you have some thoughts on O'Shea Brissett, I want you to share them with me now. I put some up here, and some of you have already started to share your thoughts. That's where we're getting started in the morning menu here on the show, that O'Shea Brissett has decided to return to the Cuse for year number two, something that was not on my mind as a giant worry. But, you know, nevertheless, some people were a little bit nervous here. So I want to take a look at what some of you had to say to the post that I put up. So Tom this morning, very early on thoughts here. Tom S. said, I'll be happy with one more year, meaning for O'Shea, going ahead of Baisley in the draft in 2019 and having a better pro career than Darius Baisley. So he wants O'Shea Brissett to come back, have a great year, and then jump over Darius Baisley in the draft and be better than Darius Baisley in the NBA as a way to stick it to the guy that left Syracuse, I guess is what Tom is saying here. So he's out for revenge. He wants O'Shea to do well for twofold, for O'Shea and because Darius Baisley didn't come to Syracuse. Don Bond said, I already knew that he would stay. Speaking on O'Shea, he's a lottery pick for next year, not this year. He's not desperate for money and fame. He's a student of the game. I like it a lot, so I'm going to put this out here once again, and I'm going to leave these up because you guys are great about responding and getting back. So so I'm putting out right now, what is your reaction slash thoughts on O'Shea Brissett's returning to Syracuse? I'm going to put these out right now so I can get your take on this, get your thoughts on this, so that we can put this up and get it rolling here, because I want to know, I want to know what people are thinking, and I love when the fans respond, because then I get to share it with everybody on the show, and it means a lot to me. You guys know that you mean a lot to me. You should know that about O'Shea Brissett returning to Syracuse, and just when you, you know, give your thoughts and, and feelings in general, I always appreciate and thank you for that time. So. That is out there right now. It is on Facebook. It's on my personal page. And it is also on my company page on Wake Up Call. 
with Dan Tortora on Facebook, and it is on the Syracuse Orange Empire group that I am an administrator of. So I want to know what you're thinking right now. And we're going to get through those throughout the show on O'Shea Brissett's return to Syracuse. So what do I think about it? Well, I've been telling you for a couple weeks here now that I thought he would come back. And I've been discussing the team and, and, you know, kind of analyzing the team based on him coming back. So what do I think about it? Number one, I think that it's a smart decision. I didn't see him leaving. I saw him staying. I saw him giving an opportunity to Syracuse, you know, one more time, one more go around here and seeing what the team can accomplish together. So I'm not surprised if people are looking for that. I'm not I'm not surprised that he's coming back. And I've stated that repeatedly. So no surprise for me. I think it's great for the team. I think that he came in with a lot of hype. I think that he went better than the hype that was around him. I think he gave even more than the hype that was around him. I think he brought something really good to the team. I think that, you know, his ability to go in right away and play and and just, I mean, I look at the fact that he just had the stamina to play 40-minute games as a true freshman. You know, there's people that have been around the block for a while that, you know, are huffing and puffing. So, you know, I, I give him a lot of credit for being a true freshman, stepping in right away, giving the best that he could possibly give, doing everything that he could possibly do. As a guy who had never played college basketball before, I give him I give him a lot of credit for that. I mean, what he did was amazing. And then when you tack onto it that he did all of this as a true freshman, he did all this without any prior experience, and that he was playing 40 minutes in a game. You know, that's that's something to me remarkable about what he's done up to this point. And I think that, you know, Syracuse fans have to find a lot of happiness and a lot of appreciation for him being somebody who could step in right away. Because if they didn't have O'Shea Brissett step in right away, then, I mean, we're looking at a team that could have fallen any which way by Tuesday that wasn't going to get them to the Sweet 16. You know, these are the, the, the opportunities that were given to Syracuse by Frank Howard stepping up, by Marek Dolajai getting offensive and attacking and, and getting after it and showing his confidence and growing throughout the season. And I know people want to talk about Pascal's hands and this, that, and the other, but Pascal Chuku at the charity stripe. And then O'Shea Brissett playing 40 minutes as a true freshman, the only true freshman that was asked to do that, getting after it, being effective right away. And then, you know, I called him three-point play O'Shea before the announcer did at the Dome, I believe. I believe I got to that within the first couple games. So I'm going to... I'm going to I'm going to take that copyright in TM. But three-point play O'Shea, I mean, that was one of the biggest parts of his game is that he attacked the basket, he finished and he was that guy that you could trust. He was that guy that when he went to the basket, you know, okay, he's going to make a shot, he's going to get fouled or he's going to get fouled and and hopefully knock down some free throws. He brought it to Syracuse. He went after it. That's one of the things that that I've, you know, constructively criticized the team about for years is that they don't attack the basket enough. And if the shots aren't falling, they're not attacking the basket. So I appreciate what he's been doing. I appreciate that he's gone after it and that he was one of those guys that, you know, was okay attacking the basket. Wasn't just chucking up threes and that's all he was doing. He got after it. He attacked. And when his shot wasn't falling, and I'll I'll mention this over and over, they're little things, but they're big for Syracuse. When his shot wasn't falling, he would step in from where he was. You know, they tell you all the time to do that. When I was playing, they told me to do that. They said, if your shot isn't falling, if you're not getting enough on it, if you're off from the outside, then take a couple, take a step in and shoot again. And then if it's not going from there, take a step in, shoot again, and then work your way back out after you build some confidence. And this is what he did. That's what he did. He constantly grew as a player, and attacked as a player, and when things weren't falling, he would adjust his game and then get after it. And that's where I have a lot of appreciation for him, and I think fans should too, is that he wasn't a guy that did what a lot of people do, 
which is the definition of insanity. I'm not making the shot, so I'm going to take it 37 more times and hope to Jesus it goes in. He was creating for himself, and he was creating all over. He was creating at the rim. He was creating at the three-point line. He was stepping inside and getting after it. I already got some... responses here and somebody was like what do you think we are we're effing ecstatic and pumped so that's the reaction that we got so far this morning is that people are ecstatic and you know other people saying you know i knew he would come back i'm not worried about this i i figured he would somebody else saying you know like i said this morning i hope that darius Baisley is is picked after him i hope that he makes a run and and, you know, does well in the draft and this, that, and whatnot. So, you know, it's it's just, it's exciting for me to see um, the fact that, you know, the fans are excited and kind of pumped about this and ready for this and, and ready to see what this team can do and what they can bring forward as they move forward in their season because, it, well, in the upcoming season in 2018-19 because this Syracuse team is... You know, with Tyus Battle coming back, which I think that he will, you know, th- this team is stacked for next year, and they have a lot of high hopes and a lot of opportunities. You know, I think that this Syracuse team is going to be even more dangerous than last year because they're going to have some depth. Now, I know that, you know, everything's prognosticating, so people want to know, well, you know, what about this and what about that and what do you think? And, it, and I mean, honestly, I believe that this team is going to be dangerous. I believe that, that this team, for everything they did this year with five and a half guys, is going to go into the 2018-19 season and have even more on the table, even more to give, because O'Shea Brissett has already gotten a season under his belt of playing 40 minutes, and with the depth, hopefully he won't have to play 40 minutes, but if he needs to, we, we know that he can. And then we look at the the rest of the team, and what Syracuse has as, as they move forward into 2018-19, you got Frank Howard, who has already figured out how to be effective offensively. We know that he's coming in off of his best offensive season that he's ever had by far, better than his first two years combined. We know that Pascal is somebody who you know has to play with those goggles when he plays sports. I mean, that's how it's got to be from here on out after eye surgery. And, you know, I don't think people give him enough credit for having to play with those, how weird it is, how you got to get used to that, how when you're sweating in them, you have to you have to adjust to that. You know, it's all about why can't he catch the ball and why can't he this and that. Try and play with goggles for 10 minutes. Go out there with goggles, sweat in them, have, have them get foggy, have them get wet, and be playing out there, and then the ball's coming flying at your face. You know, there's little things like that that people don't think about. It's not easy to play with goggles. Okay, it's just not. It's not easy at all. Yeah, they help you to see. Yeah, they protect his eyes, but that's an adjustment. There's some guys that played, you know, when they broke their nose and they play with like that clear Phantom of the Opera mask. Some people play really well and some people don't. Some people don't look like themselves at all. I remember when Rip Hamilton had it, I think it was an adjustment period. You know, Tyus Battle, if Tyus comes back and is a junior on this team, I mean, Tyus has shown his leadership, he's shown his poise, he's shown his ability to create for Syracuse. You know, there are op- there are times where people, you know, criticize the fact of, of why he was shooting certain shots and, and how he wouldn't dish it off and this and that. I do think there's a benefit to him driving and, di- and dishing and a trusting in some of these guys and letting go of the ball and and giving some opportunity to other people because everyone's always going to be spying on him. There's always going to be eyes on him. I think he can use it more to his advantage. But, you know, we talk about the big-time shots that he missed, but there's also a bunch that he made. And one of the ones that he made against Michigan State, that jumper, that step-back jumper that he made, ended up helping to save Syracuse's season and move them forward into the Sweet 16. So for all the things that people want to criticize Tyus Battle for, yeah, sometimes he forces up shots, but I feel like as the year went on, he got smarter. I feel like as the year went on, he got better, and he didn't take those crazy shots. I really don't. You know, in my opinion, I don't feel like his shots were as 
ill-advised later in the season as maybe in the early part of the season. So I want to give him credit where credit's due for that, that you know he's given the opportunity to the team to grow and advance and get better, and he's grown and advanced and gotten better and smarter in the game. So those the, that why is he taking that shot criticism to me is not there like it used to be, and that's big because he has to show his personal growth. The thing is, he's a good shooter, and they want the ball in his hands at the end of the game. At the same time, you got to take smart shots, and you have to not put your team in jeopardy by forcing up things. And he had done that in the past, but I'm seeing le- I saw less of that down the stretch. Or he was taking better shots as well. And then you know when you look at Howard Washington Jr., he's a big question mark. What's he gonna be? You know, it's kind of teetering on the is he gonna lean the Caleb Joseph side and fall out of favor with. Jim Beheim and then just kind of be sitting there waiting and seeing if he's going to transfer or is this just one of those years where Beheim, you know, didn't want to put him in and, and wanted to lean on Frank and thought it was a better decision and wanted Howard to have more time in practice. And then why didn't he redshirt him? So, I mean, there's questions that are going to come up in this situation because Howard Washington Jr. really didn't play. But there were moments when he was out there that even fans brought up, you know, he showed how effective he could be, made good passes, did some good things. So the question is, you know, where do we go from here with Howard Washington and what can he be? I mean, he's very close to O'Shea Brissett, so there's an importance and a comfort level of him being there with O'Shea. But at the same time, he's looking for his game. He's looking for his opportunities. So I'm interested to see where he's going to what he's going to you know where where he will land in the grand scheme of things when we look at the 2018-19 roster and season. Elijah Hughes. This is a guy who's worked on his body, worked on his strength, worked on his muscle and is a jack of all trades. I'm looking at him to play guard, I'm looking at him to play forward, I'm looking at him to potentially run from point guard to shooting guard to small forward this season and show what he can do and how he can open the game up for Syracuse. So that's something that I think fans should be excited about because I'm excited to see what he's going to mean for this team, what's he, what he's going to do, and he has three seasons. So that's big for him. And then Jalen Carey and Buddy Beheim, these are obvious question marks. We look on film and say, okay, this guy can do this and this guy can do that, but will it translate over into the collegiate game and that's what we wait upon to see when the game is faster when more hands are up in your face when you're doing this that and the other thing is it going to look as good as it did in high school look as good as it did in prep school and that's what is going to take hard work hard work determination and a push to see what these guys can do so they're the question marks you know we go into this season with the Howard Washington question mark, the Elijah Hughes question mark, the Buddy Bayheim and Jalen Carey question marks. But Marek was trending up. O'Shea Brissett was strong and almost averaging a double-double this season. Barama and Pascal, yeah, could work on their hands, but the team could also work on looking for them more. Tyus Battle and Frank Howard prove leadership. And I think with Frank being a senior, Tyus can say, you know what, Frank, let's get in the backcourt and do this one more time together. I'm going to be with you one more time. I know you're a senior, and I can't imagine you being in the backcourt without me next to you. Let's let it ride. They bump fists, and then they go to work. You know, that's what I see happening. I really do think the Tyus battle is going to return. You know, I'm looking at some of these mock drafts, and some of them have them high, or no, I shouldn't say high. Some of them have them in the draft, and some don't. It's not like one has them in as a, as a second rounder, and the other one has them in as a first rounder, and this one's the upper first, and this one's the lower first. He's in one of them at the bottom of the second round and then or the, of the first round and then he's not in the other ones. So, you know, it's one of those things where you're looking at it going, "Okay, uh, he's there, but he's not but he's not." You know what I mean? It's it's not the fact that, you know, there's just a little discrepancy. This person thinks he's going to go 25th, this person thinks he's going to go 21st, this person thinks he's going to go at the top of the second round. He's not really there and you know I and and like I said these this can all change it's all fluid it is all fluid I had somebody ask me last night what's going to happen and it's all fluid 
It really honestly is. Because when it comes to the NBA combine and working out for teams, you don't know what they're going to say. You don't know how they're going to react. You don't know what they're going to do. You don't know how they're viewing you. And you don't know where things are at until you work out. And once you know that, then that can change everything. Because we could be saying today, I think he's coming back. It makes sense for him to come back. But you have to ask yourself if you, like anybody else, like him or anybody trying to get into the NBA, if you go to the Combine and you leave a phenomenal impression and they say to you, hey, we would love for you to come play for us. We think you're ready. We think that you're prepared. Everything that we saw showed us even more. We thought highly of you. Now we think even higher of you, and we would love the opportunity to put you on our team. And he hears that from enough teams, all of a sudden, it is a game changer. And that's what people need to understand and need to know, is that right now, I think he's coming back. But this can change. This can change. And it has changed before. Because what you hear at this combine, that's what affects the move. That's what dictates where you go. So I think, you know, for Tyus, and people have to understand that, Tyus wants to go to the NBA, and so do many of these players. I mean, you'd be crazy to think that 99%, 95%, whatever it may be, you know, they want to go to the NBA. If I told any of these guys from any one of the universities and colleges out there that they could go to the NBA. I don't think that they would be like, no, I'm good. Even the guys that maybe don't think that they could make it, if I told them right now that it could happen, they're going to give it a shot. They're going to give it an opportunity. So when I look at the dreams and the aspirations and the hopes of O'Shea Brissett, It's not crazy for me to think that things can change based on what people are going to say. And you have to know that. You have to know that there is a chance that things could change here for the young man, depending on how people react to him at the Combine. Now, I ultimately think that he would be better proven to come back I think that there's more for him if he comes back. I think that there's plenty more for Syracuse if he comes back and that that would be a huge opportunity for Syracuse. But you have to look at him as well. It can't just be, is it going to be a big help to Syracuse? How is Syracuse going to benefit? You have to think about him. And for Tyus, you know, there's always the question of, If I come back, will I get hurt? If I come back, will it make me better? If I come back, will I go higher in the draft? Those are the questions that he has to ask himself. And if he says no, if those answers are no, you can't be mad at him if he decides to move forward. Because ultimately, it's his decision, and ultimately, you have to respect it. Because this is his dream and his aspiration. And if I told you right now that let's say you wanted to be a pilot, and well, pilot's not a good example. Let me okay. Let's say you wanted to be because pilot, you got to go through training and all that. Let me say that you want to be a movie star, right? So a bunch of people go and do stuff for three for free. They they go and do the theater downtown. They're doing really tiny shows, this that and the other. They're going to acting classes and whatnot. And I told you, screw all that. You don't have to go to any acting classes. You don't have to do anything for free, none of those productions, not working for 14 hours for no money with doing a job on the side just so people will check you out and know your name and know who you are. I'm going to sign you right now. I'm going to put you in my movie right now. After not seeing you in any of this stuff, I believe in you. I like you. I think that you got a great face, a great attitude, and I feel like your acting is on point. So I'm going to put you on the team, or I'm going to put you on my team right now. We're going to shoot this movie. We're going to make it happen. How many people would say no? How many people would say, let me consult my fan base? Right? So that's the thing that that people need to understand. And I'm not trying to come at hard and I'm not trying to come at negative. I'm trying to come at you real. And coming at you real is telling you that as much as you want him to be here, 
He's going to do whatever he wants to do. He's going to do what he feels like doing. And that's what people need to understand. Is that he's going to do what he wants to do and what he sees fit. And whether you like it or not, he's not going to consult you about it. You know, and, and we can talk about how it hasn't worked out for Syracuse guys leaving early in the sense of getting a starting job, being a prominent player, this, that, and the other. But at the same time, they're living their dreams. You know, so I look at both ends of the coins. I look at it and say, okay, Malachi Richardson's not a starter, and he's not a guy that a team is leaning on, so maybe it could have helped him out to stay a little bit longer. At the same time, he's playing in the NBA. He's been in the NBA for a couple seasons. He's had the opportunity to grow and advance his career. He has had the opportunity to get out in front of NBA scouts and personnel He's shown himself to them. He is in front of them every single day. And he's hopefully making connections and building his network. So for me, yeah, you know what? It was a good move in that sense. On the other side of it, he's not a starter. On the other side of it, sometimes it's the G League. You know what I mean? So it's not the best case scenario for him. But he's making money, he's living out his dreams, and he has an opportunity to impress people at that level. That was the argument on the side of Darius Baisley, is that he could get out in front of NBA scouts immediately, be in front of them all year long, and have a constant connection with them, going to them as opposed to them having to go to his games showing them who he is, what he's about, and how he can play up against guys that have been in the league for a few years that are trying to get jobs as well, and saying, I'm going to outwork that, I'm going to outplay that, and you're going to want me over them, you're going to want me to play for you. He's banking on himself. He's believing in himself. And he's working toward his goals. And in that sense of it, putting himself in front of everybody it's not a bad decision, and it's not a stupid decision. So you have to look at the angles, and you have to look if, if, if you could get there right now. If you wanted to be a singer, and you didn't have to do American Idol, and you didn't have to try out for this and try out for that, and send your demo tape to 720 people, and get two responses, and neither response was good, and be singing at dive bars with people booing you that are drunk, that don't even know what good music sounds like, to go through all of that, and then get to a point where somebody just looks at you and says, Hey, you got a great voice. Why don't you come to the studio? Let's record something. And if I like you, I'm going to sign you to Columbia Records. Why? I mean, why would you not do it? You know what I mean? So that's where we're at. And that's the conversation with Tyus Battle. Is if somebody wants him right now, why say no? At the same time? There is argument on why he should stay. But irregardless of what he does, people need to respect him. And I think that that's, that's the biggest thing that I'm trying to get across, is that people need to respect him. Because this is his decision and it's his family's decision. And in the case of O'Shea Brissett, I wasn't surprised. I'm not sitting here telling you, oh my God, he's coming back, this is so crazy. Because I thought that he was coming back. And our conversation said so to me. And we're going to take a step aside here on the show and come back with that conversation with O'Shea Brissett and what he had to say to me right after the loss in the Sweet 16 to Duke. We'll listen into that after this fast break. This is a wake-up call fast break. 
Carvel DeWitt, it's what happy tastes like. Do you know why? Because we make ice cream. Creamy, rich, flavorful ice cream. Not yogurt or ice milk like some of our competitors. Ice cream. Fresh, by hand, daily. For the calorie conscious, we have something new for you. Our new Carvelite. Same great flavor, creaminess, and texture of our regular ice cream with only 35 calories an ounce. So whether you want an ice cream cake, flying saucer, dasher, carvalanche, hard or soft ice cream, we will satisfy your craving with our fresh, handmade, regular, or new Carvelite ice cream. Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. This is Lawrence Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty. Call our home office at 315-752-9513. Or better yet, call or text me directly at 315-748-2524. Let me ask you a question, Lawrence. If I needed you to help me buy a house, find the right place, could you help me do that? Joe, I'll help you find your dream home. You don't ever say my name on the radio, never. If I needed to sell a house, could you help me go about that the right way? Yes, yes I can. How do they get a hold of you? Call me directly at 315-748-2524. But you also do the commercial property. So if I got a business, couple businesses, got to take one here, move it over there, do this, do that. Are you going to help me buy and sell my commercial property also? Yes, sir. I like that. I like that. What's my name again? I have no idea. Absolutely. But they need to know your name. So give it one more time. This is Lawrence Papaleo, licensed real estate salesperson for Gilbo Realty. My phone number is 315-748-2524. Why don't you tell him your name one more time and that number so we can jot it down. This is Lawrence Papaleo. Call me or text me directly at 315-748-2524. Clothing that will change with you without you having to change. DrySigLady.com, D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G, Lady. Dot com with the bamboo line relaxed fit clothing as well as the athletic fit clothing drysiglady.com is fit for any woman any time of the day anywhere whatever you're doing whatever your day commands of you command yourself to feel comfortable in drysig lady apparel d r e i s s i g lady.com for all the women out there feel good in what you're wearing and don't feel like you have to constantly change throughout the day. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, a business owner, going for a jog, going for a meeting, or just relaxing at home, DrySigLady.com is the right fit for you. D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G, Lady.com. This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that uh, positively impacting the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily you know we bring in local produce we prepare to order in the kitchen we hand bread our chicken we hand spin our milkshakes it's it's great food it doesn't taste like fast food i, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a chick-fil-a restaurant it's different we we try to treat people with intentional kindness here which is very different and deeper than good customer service and so you know, i think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick-fil-A restaurant. And then lastly, the impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick-fil-A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're, they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do is to shine a little light in their life, that's a very, very different experience uh, than you will have at any other quick service restaurant. And it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on wakeupcalldt.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on mixlr.com backslash wakeupcalldt. I let you all know that I had a conversation with O'Shea Brissett. I aired it. I let you listen to it a couple of weeks ago. And coming off of his decision to stay with the Syracuse Orange and continue to grow with this team as a sophomore was no surprise to me. 
And that was coming off of a conversation like this one. We had a couple from we had a one after the ACC tournament when they when they had lost the ACC tournament in their second game, and then we followed our conversation when they wrapped up the season in the Sweet 16 about looking to the future and, and just what his thoughts were. Here is the full conversation with O'Shea Brissett between him and myself in Omaha, Nebraska, following the game against Duke inside of the Sweet 16, where I really honestly heard him say, I'm coming back. And this was weeks before the decision, weeks before the prognosticating, this is what O'Shea had to say to me, and this is why I felt confident he would be back. First times in the second half where you guys came within one, just what you could say the separation was from them. Uh, you know, they got easy buckets. We worked for, you know, every bucket we uh, tried to get, um, you know, fouls, free throws, uh, contested shots uh, while they were getting, you know, easy tipping, stuff like that. So, you know, easy bucket compared to a tough bucket, you know, it's always going to be the easy one that comes out on top. Just what you can say defensively that you were seeing going up against them, you know, when you guys were in your zone, just how they moved around, just what led to some of those easy buckets, those baseline moves that they made? Um, it was just, you know, lobs, really. They didn't do anything special. Um, we got up on their shooters really well. Uh, they missed about seven or something in a row. Um, but, you know, you just got to give credit to, you know, their big guys down low, uh, you know, grabbing those rebounds, putting the back up, or, you know, catching the lobs that they were throwing. So, uh, you know, they didn't do anything, you know, that was something that we haven't seen before. It was very ordinary, but, you know, it's just they have those those guys down low. What was the separation, in your opinion? Was it the turnovers? You know, the, I know there was two turnovers back-to-back that led to points for them. Do you think that that ultimately was the difference? Um, you know, I can't really pinpoint one thing. Um, you know, in a whole, there was a lot of mistakes that we made that, you know, we should have capitalized on. Uh, once we got them, you know, where we wanted them on defense, they weren't scoring. We should have capitalized on the offensive end. Um, but, you know, it's just this is everything in a whole. You can't really say talk about one thing. You guys, not just in this game, but in other games inside of this tournament, pushed those teams into foul trouble, got them in the bonus early, and then got to go to the line. Just what you can say about doing things like that, knowing that you don't have a deep bench, but you were able to get some freebies there, not just in this game, but throughout the tournament. Um, you know, that's been the mindset, uh, especially today in the second half. Coach told us to attack. Um, you know, we got in the middle a lot, attacked myself, I attacked a lot. And, you know, getting them into foul trouble, like you said, so uh, just get, sticking with the same mindset, uh, knowing that we got to, you know, attack everybody. You know, it doesn't matter who. Um, something that we got to do. Down the stretch, it was still a game, and you had that leaner. Just what you can say about that. I mean, it's a phenomenal play offensively. Mm-hmm. Just what you can say about that. Uh, you know, coach, coach told me to get the ball, make a play, and, um, you know, he has trusted me, and I knew you know, I was going to knock it down, whatever happened. Um, you know, just, just another play. You're a true freshman, and you got to go to the NCAA tournament your first season. You guys won three games in five days. Just what you could say about, you know, even though it doesn't end the way that you want it to, just what you took away from it, especially knowing that you were one of those guys that had to play 40 minutes <laughs> and when you're playing three and five days. Uh, you know, it's thrilling. It's something that a lot of guys don't get to experience, even, you know, upperclassmen. Um, you know, I'm just so blessed, you know, with the abilities that I have to come in here and, um, you know, play the minutes that I do and, you know, get get the role that I have on this team. Um, you know, it's a great team, a lot of great players on, on the squad. So, you know, I'm just blessed that coach, you know, put me in that role. So, you know, the guys that are coming in next year, I feel like I'm able to educate them and let them know, you know, a lot about, you know, how the season should be and, you know, stuff like that. Ty has stepped up as a leader as a sophomore this season. You're talking about being a leader next year as a sophomore. Just bring me into that. Um, you know, you come in as a freshman, you know, wanting to learn. Um, great players always, you know, learn first before they try to, you know, lead. Uh, and, you know, I had, you know, two guys, two great players in front of me uh, teaching me the ways, teaching me how, you know, Syracuse basketball is supposed to be, uh, Ty and Frank. So, you know, next year I feel like, you know, like I said, I could, you know, help those guys out um, because I've, you know, I've been here and I've experienced so much. So, um, you know, the guys that are coming in next year, I'll be able to, you know, just calm them down because um, I know, you know, as a freshman coming in, there's a lot of pressure, especially those guys there, you know, top-ranked players. Um, so there's going to be a lot of pressure on them to do well. But, um, you know, I feel like I'll be able to, you know, help them and, you know, just sell them down a little bit so the game comes easy. Honestly, for me, just what you could say about the biggest pieces of knowledge that you learned that you've taken away from Frank and Tyus at this point? Um, just attack everybody. Um, you know, those guys, they, they have their scoring mindset. And, you know, that's something that I'm really trying to get. Um, you know, watching Ty's play, um, see him go at, at anyone that's in front of him is, you know, it's something great to see. So, you know, um, I'm just going to add that, that piece to my game. You know, whoever
whoever's in front of me just try to go at them because you know I know I have the skill for it. So um, you know that's that's just a uh, you know personal thing. Um, just taking it any that anyone's in front of me. That coming from O'Shea Brissett. So you hear in the conversation next season, next season. I want to be a leader. I know what I have to do. I know I know what I took away. I know my bumps. And so when somebody else is going through that, somebody else is experiencing that, I know how to help you through that. I know how to help you get forward, get better, to grow. I've been through those waters. I will help you navigate them from here next season. So, I mean, that's what he, and that's what he said to me in Omaha. So I wasn't concerned, and I wasn't concerned before that because I had talked to him about it, and I said, do you have any thought? And he started laughing. He goes, none at all. He said, I have not thought one bit about any of that, you know, and, and, and that that's one of those things where I believe he's coming back, but I throw that question out there to them and to, to him and, and speak with him on it because of the fact that so many people are convinced that these guys, they're leaving, they're going, oh my God, they're going to leave, they're going to go, there's no way that they're going to stay, they don't want to be here anymore, you know, that that's not always on their mindsets. Yes, it is their dream, but, you know, these guys have good heads on their shoulders and they educate themselves. So that's something that, you know, I just when I was speaking with O'Shea and, and just, you know, conversing with him throughout the season, you know, I got that vibe that he wants to be at Syracuse. He wants to grow at Syracuse. So over the weekend, he says, I'm ready for season two, ready to get after it, that they have unfinished business. And I agree. Yes, they do. And you know what, folks? I'm not surprised that he's coming back for this unfinished business, and you shouldn't be surprised either. So fans got great news, but it wasn't like, to me, it was crazy news. They got the news that I thought we would get, and that is that he is coming back to Syracuse and going to be a part of the Orange one more time. And this nucleus, you know, it is. It can happen. I know that it doesn't happen a ton, but it can happen. This whole guys coming back to have one more run together, you know? Because there's players that play as teams, and then there's players that just play, right? Kentucky just plays ball. You got a bunch of guys, a bunch of individuals. They could be great teammates. They could love each other like crazy. I'm not saying that they don't. But it's like, hey, guys, let's see what we can do this year, then I'm going to the NBA. There's no unfinished business. There's no, oh, my God, we lost to Kansas State. There's, well, that's for the other team to take care of. That's for the other new guys. There's no commitment to the team and the future. There is, I'm committed to the team right now because this is the team that I'm on to get me to the NBA, and then I'll see you later. Duke has become that way after this season as well. Marvin Bagley, raise your hand if you thought he was staying. Trayvon Duval, did you think that he was... I mean, I, I'm i surprised that he's going in the sense of his output this season, but I'm not surprised that he goes there and then it's see you later. And, they, and he chooses Duke over Syracuse because in his brain it was a better... It was a better way for him to propel into the NBA, and then it's bye. I mean, that's the thing that I tell people all the time, is that you think, oh my God, Syracuse didn't get this guy. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? 90% of these guys go wherever they're going, and then they hightail it out of there. They go spend a season, and they're gone. And Syracuse fans have told me, we don't like that. We don't like the guys that come for half a second, and then they leave. We want guys to stay here and have multiple shots at championships. Okay, well, then then Trayvon wasn't the guy for you. He wasn't the right fit for you if that's what you wanted because he's not going to give that to you. And we see that all the time. You see that all the time. Here are the guys that came down to Syracuse and whoever, and they didn't come to Syracuse. Oh, my God, Bayheim needs to quit. Really? He does? Because he brings in O'Shea Brissett, and O'Shea's coming back. Ty <clears throat> Tyus Battle came back. He didn't necessarily have to come back. People say, well, why would he leave? But that's the thing. you got to understand it. If Tyus was at Duke, and after his freshman season, if he had the same number, same output, still could have left. If he was at Kentucky, would have left. Why come back? Cal Perry's getting you out the door. He's got too many kids coming in. Doesn't have space for you. See you later. Bye-bye. You know, so in my opinion, 
when they come to Syracuse, there's more of a, we're building something. There's more of a, we're becoming something. We need another run, another go at this. Now, if they won the national championship this year, then yeah, they could go. And you can argue that if Malachi Richardson <clears throat> never made it to the Final Four and gotten all that exposure, that maybe he would have stayed. But in all honesty, Syracuse does not attract the players that want to play basketball in college for 15 minutes. <clears throat> That's not the people that they attract. So don't be surprised when those people choose other places. And when we go down the list of guys <clears throat> for the NBA that are already declared, let's take a look at who we have here. That's already said, I'm moving forward. Raleigh Elkins, DeAndre Ayton of <clears throat> Arizona, Marvin Bagley the third from Duke, Mo Bamba from Texas. You know, players that don't surprise you. Miles Bridges, who had come back to Michigan State, and now he's going. LaRon Black from Illinois. Troy Brown Jr. of Oregon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tony Carr of Penn State. Eric Davis Jr. of Texas. Trayvon from Duke. We have Drew Eubanks from Oregon State. Harry Frawling from Marquette. Mustafa Heron from Auburn. Aaron Holiday from UCLA. Jaron Jackson, who I interviewed from Michigan State, uh, Kevin Knox from Kentucky, Terry Larriere of UConn, Mature Maker out of high school. So another guy that's that's just moving forward. Anthony Simmons out of high school. Darius Baisley coming straight out. Trey Young, no surprise, out of Oklahoma. Robert Williams from Texas A&M. Lonnie Walker from Miami who is a young cat that I thought would grow in this program a little bit longer, but he's jumping. Alonzo Trier from Arizona, he's not sticking around. His coach was wiretapped. Sean Miller was wiretapped in connection with Alonzo Trier, and he already got almost suspended. So he's not going to stick around. That's writings on the wall. You tell him, you know, everything that Alonzo Trier has been through this season, he's not going to stick around to see if he's academically eligible to play or if, or if they're going to try and hold him because of the investigation by the FBI, he's getting out of there. Gary Trent Jr., who I interviewed, he's leaving Duke. Ray Spaulding, who I interviewed, he's leaving Louisville. Landry, uh, Landry pardon me, Shamet, Shamet uh, of, of Wichita State. Colin Sexton of Alabama, no surprise there. Corey Sanders of Rutgers. Michael Porter Jr., Missouri, who had an awful end of his season, plus injury. He's going to the NBA. We'll see if that affects him if he's not the number one pick. Malik Newman from Kansas. Now, I mean, Chemezi Metu of USC. DeAnthony Melton of USC. Jack McVeigh of Nebraska. Brandon McCoy of UNLV. They're all going. They're all going with agents. Those that are testing the waters. Dang Adele of Louisville. I'm not going to read all these guys off. Kai Bowman of Boston College. Why not? They had an awesome season, and they beat Duke, and they did some really good things. He's going to test the waters, too, and he's been on the show plenty of times. Jacob Evans of Cincinnati is going to test the waters. Bruno Fernando of Maryland, of Maryland is going to test the waters. Jalen Hudson of Florida is going to test the waters. We're looking at some other guys. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast, Zach Johnson. Josh Akogi of Georgia Tech is going to go out there and see what they have to say about him and if they like him and get some information. Jerome Robinson of Boston College has been on the show a ton of times. He's going to test the waters as well. Omar Yurtseven of NC State, who didn't come to Syracuse, he's going to test the waters. There's a lot of guys out there. P.J. Washington of Kentucky, he's going to see what they say. And then we know that Daniel Gafford of Arkansas Rue Hachimura of Gonzaga, Gonzaga, pardon me, Marcus McDuffie of Wichita State, Demarcus Simmons of Georgia State, and O'Shea Brissett of Syracuse, we know that they're coming back. And then there's still that, what are these kind of guys going to do? Kyle Alexander from Tennessee, Tyus Battle from Syracuse, Mikhail Bridges from Villanova, Jalen Brunson of Villanova, Wendell Carter Jr. of Duke, Hamadou Diallo of Kentucky, Dante DiVincenzo, who just won a championship with Villanova. 
Dante Hall of Alabama. What's he going to do? DeAndre Hunter of Virginia. I don't think he's ready, and he got hurt. Kelly Antilly of Gonzaga. Mo Wagner of Michigan. You know, so and Jared Vanderbilt of Kentucky. There's still these question marks of what these guys are going to do, but there's a bunch out there that are like, thanks, I'm moving on. We appreciate the time, and we're going to go on from here and do what we got to do, Coach. Thanks so much for having us, and we had a good time. Some of these guys stick around, but there's nothing wrong. And I, This is one thing I love about the NBA. They, are, they allow you to test the waters now. You don't have to sign an agent and go into the draft to be completely screwed. Okay, you don't sign an agent. You say, I want to go to the combine. The combine invites you and says, come on over. And then you go and work out and you get information. And based on the information you get, you either return to school or you sign an agent and stay in the draft. It's a great opportunity. At the same time, there's one thing that I would add to the conversation. I would say to these gentlemen, because the draft is in June and the college basketball season doesn't start until October, November, you know, you start working out media day in October, but you start playing in November. So June and November, you got, you got July, August, September in between that. I think that the guys that put their names in the draft that don't get drafted should have the availability to return to college. Now, that doesn't hinder a school from going out and getting other people and having a backup plan. Okay, It doesn't hinder Syracuse from signing this guy, that guy, and the other guy. This is how I would have it. If you declare for the NBA draft, sign an agent, and don't get drafted, you have the opportunity to return to college basketball immediately. And if your team that you are on has already filled your roster spot, they've already given your scholarship away, you have a free transfer anywhere to play immediately with no restriction of having to sit out for a year. Maybe you can restrict going in conference, right? So in the example of Tyus Battle, let's say Tyus Battle declares for the draft. He puts his name in the draft. He works out at the Combine. He likes what he hears. He signs an agent. He doesn't get drafted. He can return to Syracuse immediately and play immediately with two years of eligibility. Or he can go to Kentucky or Oregon or Wichita State or Texas and play immediately with two years left as well. There, That way, there is no hindrance on them because there's nothing that the player loses the team still has an opportunity to get them in the 11th hour, and then there's and then there's still going to be recruitment if that team doesn't want that player anymore if they've already filled the spot. So, yes, that leaves some moving pieces, some moving parts. If Tyus Battle comes back, whose scholarship do we take away? I understand that, but at the same time, these kids are doing it on the other end. They're screwing over the schools, so they can't say, well, the schools are screwing us over because... It's back and forth. It's back and forth. The players decide in the 11th hour, I'm not coming to that school, Darius Baisley. So the school can decide in the 11th hour, you know, we don't want to take you back, but you're free to play where you want to play. I think that there has to be a protection on both sides. There has to be a protection, in my opinion, on both sides. So, I'm playing college. I think I can make the NBA. I put my name in the draft. I go to the combine. They love me. I sign an agent. Something goes wrong. I don't get drafted. I come back to my school and say, I want to come back to school. I want to continue to get my education. Obviously, what I thought didn't end up working out, and I want an opportunity to keep playing. And that opportunity should be there because there's too many kids get lost in the cracks. There's so many people out there telling thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men's basketball players that they are the best, that they're going to get drafted, that it's their payday. They're going to make that money. 
And it doesn't happen for everybody. Somebody's lying. Somebody's not telling the truth. And those kids that are lied to should have the opportunity to come back and continue their education and make smarter decisions instead of just throwing them to the wild and saying, well, go play overseas. You're screwed now. I don't agree with that. We'll take a step aside. We're going to switch gears, come off the court, go on to the field as Irv Phillips will join me live in just a moment from Syracuse football. This is a wake-up call fast break. Hi, this is Domenico Vitali, owner of Giovanni's Formal Wear, where you look great and feel even better with our renowned tailoring and alteration services on any suit or any tuxedo from anywhere. Call 315-455-8729. That's 315-455-8729. Stop in locally on Route 11 in North Syracuse next to the Ponderosa Plaza where you can choose your style, get fitted, and tailored, all at Giovanni's Formal Wear. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice when buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. It would be For all of us that have always wanted our favorite restaurant to come to us, it's now a reality in Central New York with It's a Utica Thing. With Utica Pizza Company bringing their wonderful recipes that they've handed down through generations to you, to your event, to your business, to your home. It's a Utica Thing. Proudly bringing Utica Pizza Company on wheels to your location. Call 315-738-8946. That's 315-738-8946 to bring Utica Pizza Company to your doorstep with It's a Utica Thing. This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that... uh, positively impacting the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily. You know, we bring in local produce. We prepare to order in the kitchen. We hand bread our chicken. We hand spin our milkshakes. It's it's great food. It doesn't taste like fast food. I, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a Chick-fil-A restaurant. It's different. We, we try to treat people with intentional kindness here which is very different and deeper than good customer service. And so you know, I think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick-fil-A restaurant. And then lastly, the impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick-fil-A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're, they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do is to shine a little light in their life. That's a very, very different experience uh, than you will have at any other quick service restaurant. And it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on wakeupcalldt.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on mixlr.com backslash wakeupcalldt. Happy to be here with you this morning and every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on MixLR.com backslash Wake Up Call DT. And coming up right now live on the line is Irv Phillips, played running back, H-back, and wide receiver during his time at Syracuse. A jack of all trades, but something that can help him out when it comes to the NFL hopes and the draft that is coming up very shortly here He will be joining us before that draft on Sunday, April 15th at 2 p.m. This coming Sunday at the Wildcat Sports Pub for a live special engagement show and to see the fans one more time. But before that, he's here with us this morning. Irv, how are you doing today? Good, Dan. I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing well. And and, and Irv, you know, you've been 
obviously working out and getting some opportunities with teams out there. Just what you can say about what this experience has been like for you so far. I guess I want to start with Pro Day and what you took away from Pro Day at Syracuse. Um, I think Pro Day was a great experience to get out there in front of this coach and just show what I had. Um, I was working out for a while, you know, I've been working for it for a while, you know, a couple months. And it, was, it was good to finally just get out there and just, just show my talent and just, you know, uh, get an opportunity to just And what can you say about, you know, how many teams were there? I know it's a closed off thing to the community and, and whatnot, but how many teams were you able to work out in front of when it came to Pro Day? Um, I believe there's about 20 teams there, if I'm not mistaken. So you have 20 teams out there. Do they take you aside? Do they talk to you at all? Was there any conversation? Were they just there watching and, and that was it? Or was there any interaction? Um, after, after pro day, I talked to a couple of teams, you know, they gave me some feedback on a couple of things, you know, we basically just talked about, uh, a little bit, just trying to get to know me and, uh, some things about, you know, me personally and things like that. And, and who were the teams that you got to speak with that gave you some feedback when you're discussing after pro day, there were some teams that came up to you and wanted to get to know you personally a little bit more. Who were some of those teams? So the Jets, the Broncos, and the Bengals. I want to start with the Jets. What was that experience like, and, and what was your takeaway from that? What can you say about you know how the Jets interacted with you and what they took away from you? Um, basically uh, com complimented me on my career at Syracuse, and um, basically uh, talked about the things that I was, that I was able to accomplish, you know, my consistency and things like that. But, um, you just was telling me about how I was, a, I was a real good receiver and um, talking to a lot of things. And then as far as the Broncos, what was their interaction like? What do they have to say? Um, he, he more was uh, talking about, he wanted to find out more about my knowledge of the game. He asked me about uh, identifying coverages, and he started asking more personal questions about me, my family, and things like that. And, and when they ask you more personal questions, speaking here with Irv Phillips, now a Syracuse football alum as he heads toward the NFL draft coming up at the end of the month. Irv, when they're asking you these personal questions about family and whatnot, what are they asking you? What what did they want to know about your personal life? Um, basically, where I grew up, uh, my type of personality, what kind of person am I, my siblings, um, uh, where I played ball at in high school, things like that. And when they ask you those questions, when they ask you kind of like, where did you grow up? What was the neighborhood like? How, you know, was your mom there? Was your dad? I mean, is it weird for you to, to, to answer questions like that? Cause I mean, they're obviously looking at your personality and there's reasons why they're asking these questions and kind of digging a little bit here and digging a little bit there. Is it strange to, to be so personal in that respect, or how did you kind of handle the situation? Um, I didn't really look at it that way. I just looked at it like they, you know, if they do pick me up or whatever the case is, you know, they want to know everything about me and because they're invested in me. So I just looked at it as they, they just want to make sure they know the type of player they're going to be taking or if, if I'm the kind of player they want to take. Did you tell them that you came in with a chip on your shoulder from Connecticut and you came out with a chip on your shoulder from Connecticut and did some good things in between? Uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't get a chance to tell them that, but, you know, they'll figure that out eventually. And and then looking at the Bengals, what was that experience like for you when you got to speak with them? Uh, the Bengals scout was kind of running the, the portion where we were uh, on the field running routes. And um, he was just giving me feedback on um, on kind of little things as far as my technique and, um, and uh, my, my route running while we were doing routes and stuff like that. So when you went through Pro Day, I mean, it was your first Pro Day. You've seen other guys do it and heard about, you know, what some of your teammates had to go through and whatnot. Overall, what was the experience like for you? What can you say about 
actually doing your own pro day and coming off of that? Um, I think once you get out there, your adrenaline is rushing. You know, obviously, it's something that you're preparing for. You kind of, you know, kind of got the butterflies before, but once you pretty much get out there, it's like it's, it's pretty much natural. You're just going out there and doing what you've been doing, you know, for a while. So I would say it was just a, a normal, like, workout, but just in front of a, a bunch of people. I feel like I was pretty much relaxed, and it was just it was just a normal routine because i just been preparing for it for so long. Speaking here with now Syracuse football alum as well as NFL prospect Irv Phillips. Irv, you played H-back, you played running back, you played wide receiver. The versatility, just what you can say about that when you finally went through Pro Day, how that versatility helps you, and just what you think that can do for you moving forward, that you've played in multiple different offenses at Syracuse, and playing within different offenses, you've also had different roles. Um, I think that could play into my advantage because, uh, you know, the more you can do, I think the more valuable you are. So uh, the fact that I've, I've did multiple things and, um, and I have that ability, I think that, that ups my stock and makes me a little bit more valuable because it can use me in different ways. So I think that's that's good on my end. And and to see you know the the fact that you've been able to do different things and whatnot at wide at wide receiver and at running back, do you? I mean, do they see you as a wide re- wide receiver? Are they looking at you in that respect, or do they? Do you get the notion that some of these scouts are kind of looking at you still as a jack of all trades and somebody? who can do a lot of different things. I mean, what's been kind of the vibe that you're getting? Is it traditional wide receiver, or is it more of a slash type of opportunity? Um, Most of the scouts see me um, having the ability to play a a slot receiver role, but um, that's, that's what I've been getting back for the most part. And then after you got to talk with those teams, speaking here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, with Irv Phillips, you got the opportunity to move forward from there. After Pro Day, after conversations with the Jets, the Broncos, and the Bengals, you have since worked out for the Seahawks, the Niners, and the Giants. I want to start out with the Seahawks and the Niners. I know that that they both came this way. You didn't have to go out that way. What was the experience like with the Seahawks? We'll start there. Um, that was that was just one on one, more personal. Is me and Steve, and we we're out there just. You know, running running routes. You know, it was more football based. You know, actually working on our craft. So we, we got out there and we just they told us what routes to run. Just ran out there and did it. That, that was basically just it was more a one on one of them really getting to see how we how we move and how we how we run routes. Did they spend some time with you afterward and give you any feedback after that? kind of gave us some feedback as we were going, as we were uh, working out. Afterwards, they, they were kind of in a rush, so we didn't talk for too long or too much because they had to go. But, you know, we were, we were discussing some things like as we, as we were going, you know. And then as far as the Niners went, what was that experience like and what can you say about that? The Niners and Seahawks, they both were there at the same time, so it was a uh, both of the scouts were there at the same time working us out. So they they come in separately from what's going on with you for pro day, and yes. they're working out. They're working you guys out together, just you and Steve. Yeah, exactly. And so you're running these routes, doing the thing, and they're being quick. What was that? I mean, even though it was more rapid, and you get to spend a lot of time with them, that experience for you to know that the Seahawks and the Niners found it important enough for them to physically be there for you and for Steve Ishmael and just work you guys out, just just what that meant to you and that opportunity because, you know, living in the moment and appreciating in the moment, that's pretty awesome, in my opinion, that you're going to have two of these franchises that are saying, you know what, I need to see a little bit more of Irv Phillips, so I'm going to take a little bit more time with him here in Syracuse. That had to be a big moment for you. Yeah, it was, it was a humbling opportunity. Um for them to even come out and uh, show us that 
that they uh they're interested in and working us out and seeing more about us. You know, it's, it's definitely a great experience. Uh, uh, I, I feel like I, I showed them a couple of things that I was able to catch the ball and run some some different type of routes. And you know, I was just I was just happy that we had the opportunity to work out. You know, every any opportunity is a good opportunity, so I was I was happy with it. And then you had the opportunity after that to work out with the Giants, and you and I spoke very closely to that recently here. Just what you can say about you know that experience and what you took away from that and having the opportunity now to work out with both teams that play at MetLife, or speak to both teams that play at MetLife Stadium, just what the Giants experience was like. Um, it was an opportunity to see their facilities and uh, where, where they practice at and uh, things like that. Got an opportunity to meet like the head coach, coaching staff, position coaches, and stuff like that. Um, that was definitely a, a great opportunity to to get in there and really get a feel of what uh, NFL experience is like for the players and what their facility looks like and things like that. And um, as far as getting out there and running routes and stuff like that, uh, that, that was just another good experience to get out there. And I'll show them what I have, but uh, I definitely, it definitely was amazing to see their facility and meet those coaches and uh, get in there and just, you know, get a feeling for what it's like to be in a, a NFL uh, building facility. And you know, you're you're no stranger to Matt Life, so just bring me into you know, kind of maybe surreal going to Matt Life to work out with the Giants and see the facility when you've already played at Matt Life yourself. Yeah, I've played there twice, you know. Uh, I definitely would like to play there again, you know, in the future if, 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 the, if the chips fall that way. But um, it was definitely cool, like, seeing it another time, you know, and just, just being there, just being there and seeing it after. I know I played there twice already. It's kind of, it was kind of cool. And when you have that, when you have that experience of already being in there, what did that do for you to to revisit it again? I mean, it's a different feel. It's it's a different opportunity than obviously when you went in there playing for Syracuse. But to have that unique experience of the Giants saying, "Hey, come in and work out with us," and you going back to a familiar place, a familiar stadium, just what that did for you. Maybe some thoughts or feelings that were going through you as you walked back into an arena that you had been in before. a little bit on the times that I did have there and um, other games I played there and, you know, just all the films and stuff that went through my mind uh, when I when I played there those those two times. I think that's, for the most part, that's what's going through my head. And, and having that experience and, and having that opportunity, you know, Syracuse fans don't like when games are away from home. They're not big fans of taking it away from the Dome. But for you as a player, what can you say about – the experience of it all. I mean, do you do you honestly feel that that experience of, of being at MetLife and, and playing there a couple times and having that home game be away, so to speak, was was a good experience for you and a good opportunity? How do you view it as a player that you got to play in an NFL stadium, not once but twice? Oh, I loved it. I wish we, I wish we could have did it more. You know, it was a great experience going to a different venue and just. Uh, Especially at NFL venues, this is great. Like I, I really wish a lot of people can experience it because it's, it's really like a once in a lifetime experience. So I enjoyed it. That coming from Irv Phillips and Irv, you got on Friday the thirteenth. You will have an opportunity to work out with the Buffalo Bills. You will be with teammates, linebackers Jonathan Thomas and Zaire Franklin. You'll be doing your thing. They'll be doing their thing. Just what you can say about what's coming up with the Buffalo Bills, your excitement for that, and knowing that you're going to be with some familiar faces out there. Well, just another opportunity, man. Just another opportunity to go out there and showcase my skills. Um, I'm glad and humble that I have another opportunity like this to um, just to show them what, what I have. You know, uh, you know, I'm just preparing by just staying in shape, uh, running around, staying crisp, you know, going out there and just make sure I'm prepared to show these coaches what I have. And to look at, you know, from Pro Day with about 20 of the 32 teams showing up 
at Pro Day and then you having an opportunity to speak with the Jets, speak with the Broncos, speak with the Bengals, work out for the Seahawks, the Niners, the Giants, and the Bills coming up. Just when I say that all to you, I mean, you have more than half of the NFL that's at Pro Day. You have three teams that want to talk with you more so after. And then you have four teams so far that want to work you out from there. Just what that's done for you. You know, the guy who wasn't given a lot of stars, wasn't given a lot of credit, coming out of a state that wasn't getting a lot of respect. From the day that I met you and even before that on the phone, you were the guy of, well, what's he going to be coming from here? It's not Florida. It's not Texas. And you always took that and put it on the field and made it something good, made it something that you could be proud of. So when you see these teams coming to you now saying, Irv, we want to know more about you. We want to get a feel more about you on the field, who you are as a person, how much you know about the game, just what all of this has done for you as you continue to work toward your goals and your dreams, knowing that that guy that they criticized before they even knew him is a guy that is getting looks, getting opportunities, and, and God willing, going to get a chance in the NFL. Uh, I think it's just a testament to my hard work. You know, um, I'm used to playing an underdog role, whether whether it's high school, college, or whatever. Now, and to the experience I'm having now, um, I know I know my talent. I know I, I do have talent, regardless of if I'm getting the the you know exposure from these scouts or whoever. I don't really, I never needed any hype or anybody to hype me up because I know I have talent, regardless. I feel like it's, it's going to show whether 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 it's now or later. You know, but like if if you can play, you can play. If you can't, you can't. And I feel like I can play, and I have that ability. So, whatever level I'm at, you know, any opportunity, I'm I'm going to take it, and I'm around with it, and try to try to show what I have. And I think that's what I've been doing so far. You know, and this is just another step and a, another chance to to do that. So. That's, that's where I stand on that. I, I'm just confident in myself. And I know what, what I can do. What, for you, repping West Haven, Connecticut, and West Haven High School, just what that means to you for what you're doing, what you have done, what you've accomplished, having these, these hopes of the NFL now, to, to look at the hometown of West Haven, Connecticut, and to look at your high school, just what it means to you to be a representation of Connecticut football and a representation of your family and of your home? Um, you no, know, I just want to set the bar high, you know. I want to set the bar for my city, you know. Obviously, you know, i got a lot of people who are supporting me from my city, so I just want to um, keep on being an example, you know, and hopefully – set the groundwork or set a path for kids who are trying to follow in the same path as me or maybe go in that underdog world are not getting enough and much support as they, they should, you know, you know, and maybe they can look at my story and look at my experience and have, have some hope and, um, and I can motivate them to, you know, continue to beat the odds and, um, continue to be successful regardless of their situation. So, that that means a lot to me, me knowing that I come from somewhere that doesn't get a lot of respect, you know, and uh, being a person that that still thrived throughout all that and um, still made a way for myself. And, and Irv, not only have you, you know, made a way for yourself and moved forward, but you you've always done it with a smile. Just what you could say about your positive attitude, your nature about you to just be the guy that's going to go out there and live his dreams and irregardless of what anybody says or does you're going to have a smile on your face and you're going to bring it every time yeah that's, that's what i always do man i've always been smiling my whole life man. That's, that's, that's what i do i think for me i just i just can't let anybody take the smile off my face because you know if they do that i feel like they that's that's me i'm losing myself you know so i think Biggest part of just staying true to myself and staying with a positive attitude. I think um, positivity can take you a long way um, with, with anything, regardless of the negative situation, always looking at it from the, a positive aspect rather than a negative. So I'm going to just continue to smile throughout everything because I know I'm blessed to be in this position. 
Yeah, coming from Murph Phillips, I don't know a better way to end that other than by saying you could see us this Sunday, April 15th at 2 p.m. at the Wildcat Sports Pub, 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus. It is one final opportunity for Irv, for Jonathan Thomas, as well as Zaire Franklin to see the community, to hang out with you all, give an autograph, take a picture, take some time before they move on to the NFL and their hopes of moving forward and, and living their dreams. Irv, you know, we're, I, I'm, you know, I'm excited to have you. I'm excited to have you out there. And, and I told you this every single time I think my brain says Irv Phillips and anytime that comes out, I will never forget the moments of you. Like I said, being in a press conference and doing your thing and whatever, and then come around the corner and always taking the time to say hello, no matter when it was or what was going on. And always kind of like shout me out when you're coming out of the thing. And I said, I, I will always remember the moments of you coming out, all the cameras go off. I'm sitting there and I think I was talking to my wife on the phone and you came around the corner and it was, what up, Dan? And so <laughs> I'll never, I mean, it's those moments that you never forget because you said, how can I let anybody take the positivity off my face? How, if I let them take my smile, then I'm going to lose myself. I'm not going to be me. And I want you to know that that attitude and that nature is contagious and that your positivity bred positivity in my life. And so if that, you know, if you can take that home and do anything with it, know that your positivity goes beyond you. And I think that, you know, that's something that, that you should know. All right. I appreciate that, Dan, man. That does, that does mean a lot for me, you know. Just, it just gives me, gives me the strength and motivation to keep pushing forward, knowing that people's watching and can see that, you know, that's great. Well, you know, I want an Irv Phillips jersey on my wall. I got a wall of fame. So when when my guys make it, that wall of fame has to get a little bit busier and a little more crowded. So I'm going to be looking for a, a Phillips jersey up here at some point. They got to make that happen. Right, definitely. We got to get one up there. That coming from Irv Phillips. Well, Irv, we will see you very soon. We'll see you this Sunday. Last note here, what do you want to say to the fans about coming out and hanging out on Sunday? What do you want them to know about this opportunity to get in front of them again? Um, just, you know, just being excited to talk to the fans one last time, you know, uh, all the fans have always supported me throughout my four years, and you know, I'm just excited just to get a chance to come see them and, um, you know, talk some ball, maybe sign some more grass, take some pictures, whatever the case is, you know, just getting out there one more time. That coming from Irv Phillips, Syracuse alum and moving forward to the NFL. Irv, as always, I appreciate it. And from that first day that I met you, at practice after I had spoken with you on the phone and you talked to me about what you wanted to be and how you were ready right now. I never forgot that. And I don't think either one of the staffs did either because they let you play all the way through. I'm looking forward to your story continuing and I'm looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Man. All right, man. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. See ya. That coming from Irv Phillips, Syracuse football alum, H back running back wide receiver so slot receiver makes sense because a guy of his size and stature who's already done a little bit of everything at the line of scrimmage makes sense to be a slot receiver and I think that you can make your hay and I thought it was interesting that he said the Jets were talking with him because I feel like the Jets are one of those teams that kind of appreciates that position so you know it's just kind of cool not too far away Giants too because the Giants need a lot of help Giants trying to figure out what their receiving core is gonna look like and they had to deal with a ton of injuries last year to the receivers, so that'll be an interesting scenario. And then on top of that, the Broncos, Broncos need help. The Bengals, yeah, they got A.J. Green and this and that, but they, they don't have a consistent number two guy or a number three guy, let alone. I mean, they, if you don't have a number two, you don't have a three, a four, and a five. So the Bengals need depth. And, you know, the Niners, if Irv got to go play for the Niners, that team is getting stacked right now. And the Seahawks? Seahawks all need all kinds of help from guys like Irv because they can't run the ball. They can't figure it out. And a guy like Irv is, you know, with reverses and different things that he can do at the line of scrimmage, it could be dangerous. We'll take a quick step aside. Speaking of dangerous, we're going to go to the other side of the football and talk about that man that played middle linebacker that was pretty damn good, that was a captain and representing Syracuse at the ACC Media Days all the time and just being that guy that was the face of the program in so many ways. Zaire Franklin's coming up next. This is a wake-up call. Fast break. 
Gear up with the real deal at Dreisig Apparel. Creating what people are going to see and learn about you before they even meet you. Gear up for what you need for your team, business, or event. To look professional, look good, and feel good, outfit yourself at DreisigApparel.com. That's D-R-E-I-S-S-I-G Apparel.com. The only place to gear up with the real deal. What's the universal language of a fan? Clapping your hands. With Fan Hands, the ultimate sports fan accessory, find your team color, slip them on, and start cheering on your favorite team with 11 different colors always in stock on FanHands.com, where you'll find the ultimate sports fan accessory. Real fans wear Fan Hands. Utica Pizza Company spells family. Your family. My family. Their family. The recipes that they have shared with each other throughout the years and have now been so gracious to share them with us. I can sit here and talk with you about all the great things that are on the menu. We'd be here forever. So let me say this. Utica Pizza Company is second to none. And now you can bring it home with you and you can dine in in the restaurant. UticaPizzaCompany.com will give you all the information that you need. And let me say, these Utica Greens... They're the best. Utica Pizza Company. Call them and place your order at 315-214-3060. That's 315-214-3060. Families break bread at Utica Pizza Company. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash call. DT, it is an honor and a privilege, as always, to have the guests that we've had on the show. We've had over a thousand voices grace the stage of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. One of those voices that's been on this stage numerous times is Zaire Franklin. He was on it on National Signing Day and all the way through from season to season, being a captain to being a captain to being a captain. Representing AC, representing Syracuse at ACC Media Day consistently, he has been a voice that is no stranger to the show, and he's been a player on the field that should be no stranger to your memories of those moments that Syracuse had, where really good things happen. I'm I'm always a firm believer that the record doesn't adequately show the fight of the gentlemen that have come together to do what they do. And Zaire Franklin, who went through different defenses, different coordinators, different coaching styles and schemes found a way to stay relevant as he pushes forward for the NFL right now. And with utmost respect for the man that wears number four, I welcome him into the show. Zaire, how you doing today? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Doing well, man. So what's uh, what's going on with you? you? You've you been busy. you got a lot of stuff going on. I want to start with Pro Day. I just had Irv on the show here a couple minutes ago. What's pro? What was Pro Day like for you? I know about 20 of the 32 NFL teams showed up. So what can you say to me about Pro Day? Um, you know, for pro day for me, uh, it was just an uh, opportunity to, you know, finally show, you know, exactly what I could do, you know, directly to the pro scouts, uh, you know, for a guy, you know, I didn't really get any, I didn't get any advice, uh, about senior, uh, all-star games or the NFL combine. So I took it like as a challenge for myself to just, you know, one of the biggest job interview of my life, you know, basically. So, you know, I approached it that way, extremely competitive, and, you know, I prepared really, really hard for it. And, um, you know, it was actually just a great experience to finally just, you know, let the fruits of my labor kind of show on, like, the big stage. And, Zaire, for you, when you didn't get any senior game in- invitation or combine invitation, how did you take that and how did you handle that? I mean, knowing you over the years, I would venture to say that, that was motivation, and you probably, after all the invites came out, went in the gym, started lifting, and then probably went to the Ensley Center and started running. I mean, how did you respond to this? Because what I think of, of Zaire Franklin is you took that as a direct hit and then said, you know what, that means I'm just going to fight that even harder going from here. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I found out, I was I was still training in um, Seattle, and uh, uh, I, I was uh, kind of expecting that uh, – I was expecting to get the uh, combine, but and uh, it ended up not coming to. When I found out, I mean, I was slightly disappointed, but at the same time, I knew I was going to have an opportunity. And I just, you know, I'm the type of person that just kind of 
let things happen as they be. Uh, you know, it's not my plan. It's, it's God's plan. So I just knew that, you know, if I just, you know, kept my head down, did what I'm doing, what I kept doing, what I was doing, kept putting the work in, and, you know, things are worked out for the best. So, uh, you know, I took it as just an opportunity to, you know, really prove everybody wrong once again that, all right, you don't have to invite me to these games. I don't have to invite me to the combine. I'm going to still get there regardless. So, you know, I just took it as a challenge. Speaking here with Zaire Franklin, Syracuse Orange alum now for the football team, played middle linebacker, was the was the quarterback essentially of the defense, as we like to call it, and is moving forward now to the NFL. You said it's not my plan, it's God's plan. I live in a world, Zaire, and I think you can appreciate and respect this because we're not too many years apart. When I was a kid, you know, it was almost like everybody believed in God. And if you didn't go to church or you didn't, you know, say your prayers and whatnot, you got in trouble. And nowadays it seems like, you know, there's that want by maybe mainstream media to push God off to a corner somewhere and, and shut the lights off and leave them shivering there and not talk about them. What can you say to that respect? I mean, do you feel like times have changed, number one? And number two, you're not afraid to say, I believe in God, it's God's plan, and and from somebody on the other end of this conversation that can respect and appreciate that, it goes a long way. So just to go a little bit deeper on that. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, personally, I, I don't really, you know, I'm the type of person that uh, I don't I don't really care what mainstream or, you know, kind of what other people do uh, that are not directly involved, you know, in my life. Uh you know, I, I'm this type of person who, you know, I was raised by the faith. Like, I went to church almost every Sunday when I was younger. And then as I got older and, um, you know, it became more of a choice rather than an obligation by my parents. Uh, and as I started to go through things in my life and the experience that I had through, um, you know, that was the, the, the thing that kept me saying that was the only reason why I'm even here today. You know, you know so... Um, I can't really, I feel like everybody has their own different path. I mean, the media is the media, mainstream is mainstream. You know, I can't control whatever they want to do or whatever they want to push or not push. You know, I don't really have a say so in that. All I can say is, you know, how I feel, how I was raised and the things that I was going through. So, you know, just to speak on that, I mean, I mean, God is the only reason why I'm here today. He's the only reason why I made it through half the stuff that I made it through. So, or everything I made it through. So, um, you know, that's just, I just speak from my personal experience. And if that inspires somebody to, you know, want to dip deeper in their faith, then, you know, that's beautiful. And if it doesn't, it just inspires them to want to work hard. That's all right, too. So, you know, I'm just the type of person I just follow my own path. That coming from Zaire Franklin, following his own path and continuing on in, in his life. Now, one of those paths that you've had on that path, Zaire, you, you've had this this opportunity to be at ACC Media Day. Over and over and over again, I, you represented the team three times for the defense. It set it, it equaled a record for Syracuse on who they've sent the most time, I guess, to media days and whatnot. So I was there every single time, interviewed you every single time. And when I sat there this time around, they asked you what it felt to be there. And you said, I think I'm kind of good now. You know, it's kind of like the same now. I kind of like going through the motions now. So everybody's like, oh, man, you know, you got to do it three times in a row. You're representing the team. This is great. And 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 Zaire's like, you know what? I probably want to go see a movie right now. You know, <laughs> just what you can say about the experience of representing so many times. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, it was obviously it was always a good. I've always had a great time going, you know, um, opportunity to not only represent, you know, Syracuse University in the light that it was supposed to be represented in and speak on behalf of my team, but, you know, also a chance to, you know, be able to put a, a, a face to the name, you know, get a chance to interact with a lot of other top guys in ACC, um, you know, as well as different media members that I've met that th throughout the country that would, you know, end up, you know, getting, uh, become like getting friends with and stuff like that. So I always had a great experience when every time I went. But, uh, you know, media day is, is, is always right before camp, and around that time you're getting a little itchy. And, you know, seeing all those dudes in different colors kind of make you feel a certain type of way sometimes. <laughs> so um, it was just like every year was always around that time. But I always had a great time, though. And, I mean, how is it? How is the interaction when, you know, when when Louisville and B.C. and, 
and Clemson and Florida State and Wake Forest. I mean, the and NC State, the teams you're seeing every year, Pittsburgh, and then obviously there's a rotator. But those teams, I mean, these are guys that that you battled on the field. These are guys that you went up against, that you knocked on the ground, that you stood over, that you talked trash to. When when you're in a building and it's like, hey, everybody, just wear a suit and shake hands and let's get a soda together. I mean, it's it's got to be weird for you, like you said, because those other colors make you feel some type of way. Uh, not really though. Um, you know, all the guys there are, you know, we are great players. So, you know, the same way I got one up on them, you know, there's, there's a couple of them that got one up on me. Um, but you know, when you play great players, you know, you, you even though you guys might battle and talk trash and, you know, really go after it in between the whistles at the end of the game, there's always a mutual respect afterwards. So, you know, even though we're all on different sides, you know, I actually, uh, became friends with a lot of guys, you know, from different teams, especially usually the guys from Louisville. Um, you know, James Burgess is, you know, he's a guy that I got cool with. And so Jair Alexander, he's another good guy from Louisville. Um, even a couple of guys from Clemson. So, you know, those guys are, you know, you get a chance to kind of meet those dudes. And it's like I said, it's a, it's a mutual respect. And I mean, but if, I mean, if somebody there and they have hostility, you know, I'm going to just match that energy. <laughs> and we, we don't have to say anything to each other. We'll just understand what it is. So, But it, it was never really that serious. Speaking here with Zaire Franklin, the linebacker for Syracuse, now an alum of the team and, and moving forward as a prospect in the NFL for the draft coming up very shortly here in April. Zaire, one thing that you have before we get into the teams you've worked out with and whatnot, you put up a, a message on February 9th, 2017. You've left that tweet pinned on at Ziggy Smalls underscore how people can follow you on Twitter and and you put they said you raised that boy too fast but you were raising a warrior we're we victorious they'll never take the joy from us R.I.P. to a queen just to go a little bit deeper on that on that message and obviously on the woman who raised you um uh that's a a quote from one of my favorite Jay-Z songs uh called the joy when he uh, kind of talks about like kind of how his mom, you know, just struggled to raise straight raise him on her own, and you know how he he's saying that no matter what they do, you know, they'll never you know take that happiness from him. And you know that that's the anniversary of my mom's uh, passing, and you know it was just my ode to her. Uh, every time I hear that song, is I think about her, and um, you know, just miss her. Just understood that everything that I do is. You know, it's for her. You know, the reason why I was so adamant about getting my degree and making sure I did well in school was because I know that's what she always wanted for me. And I'm just living my, my living her dream by, you know, do the things that I did. Her dream for me. I have a very, very, very close relationship with my mom. And I know how important she's been to me and the, the woman that she's been to me, the warrior that she's been. And, you know, even the battle she fights today. Uh, you know, for me, she's fighting some of her toughest battles in this moment at this point in her life, and and I feel honored to be a warrior on her side. I can't imagine life without her being there and me waking up and saying, "Hey, mom, what's going on?" So, you know, what's what's it been like for you, and and how have you navigated this, Zaire? Because to me, you know, I mean, I, I see that message to your mom, and I didn't meet your mom, but it's like it it, it gets you kind of worked up to see a message like that. And it makes me think of my mom and, and how important she was to me and, and how without my mom, I don't know what the heck I'd be doing right now. So just, you know, what you could say about navigating through life with her memory. And, and if you feel her there with you to this day, if you get those little instances where you're like, all right, mom, I know you're messing with me right now. Uh, I mean, best thing I can really tell you, I mean, I just felt like, I mean, I saw it in a movie once, I can't remember exactly what, what it was, but somebody, somebody said that if, uh, somebody was telling their son that if I raised you to where you couldn't survive without me, I didn't do my job. You know, so it was, it's like just one of those things where, you know, you know, even though she left me earlier than most, uh, you know, she gave me the tools and, you know, different lessons that helped me, you know, survive in this world and things that she used to tell me every day is still things that I still follow um, to the T right now. So, I mean, obviously, I miss her, um, you know, and I always feel like she's always here with me, you know. Um, but it's just something it's something that never gets easier. You just get used to dealing with. So, um, 
like I said, uh, my, my memory from her never fades and how I feel about her never fades, but it's just understanding that she's here just in, in spirit, just not in the physical. There's a picture of this, this young man that you have on Twitter and, and this young man being the, the young version of, of, of Mr. Zaire Franklin. What would be your advice to that young man if you got to meet him today? We did a little Back to the Future stuff, and you got to go back in time and hang out with him. What would you say to him? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't change a thing. I don't know. I would just tell him to keep working. I would just tell him that he could be better than everybody he even imagined. And just, you know, tell him to believe in himself. I mean, I don't the type of person I don't live life with any regrets. I mean, everything that's ever happened, every decision I ever made, right or wrong, win or loss, has helped me make me to the person I am today. And, you know, regardless of how everything goes, even if I end up never playing in the NFL, if I never play a, a snap of meaningful football ever again, I'm blessed to ever even be in this position. So, I mean, it kind of is. It is. I'll probably tell him to go get my mom a hug and kiss one time, but that's probably about it. That coming from Zaire Franklin. Zaire, before I let you go, to look at, you know, like you said, if, if you never play it down again, but I, I don't think that's going to be the case. There are teams that have taken looks at you, and, and you've had some opportunities. Share with everybody here on Wake Up Call this morning who you've gotten to work out with so far, interact with at this point. Uh, so far I've worked out for the Seahawks, the 49ers. Uh, I have an upcoming workout with the Buffalo Bills and the Eagles. Um, on top of that, teams I've talked to include Miami, um, the Broncos, uh, the Ravens, the, the Raiders, the Jets. Um, it's really, it's, it's a lot of them. It's, it's basically the Tampa Bay Bucks. Um, uh, I can't even remember all of them right now, to be honest with you. I'm kind of blanking on you. <laughs> It's really uh, the Redskins. The Redskins has recently reached out as well. Um, so I, I've had I've had interest from basically half the NFL. So um, you know it's just been good right now, just trying to take everything as it comes. And when you have that, like you said, interest from basically half the NFL. I mean, you have you have worked your tail off since you were a young man. You've gone through stuff off the field, the adversity of your mom, obviously your mom passing away everything that's happened up to this point, other adversity that's happened off the field, on the field, to get to this point where you have interest from half of the NFL, if not more, just what that does for you, the guy who, like you said, I don't care what other people think. I don't care what other people say. I go to work every single day. I'm here to live my life. And kind of taking a page out of Irv Phillips' book in the sense of he had just said to me here on the show, he said, I can't stop smiling because if I let them take my smile – then I let them take me. And it seems like you've lived that same life. I'm going to be me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live how I want to live to the best of my ability. And now half the NFL has said, Zaire Franklin, what's your story? That's got to be something compelling and pretty amazing for you. I mean, yeah, it's like I said before, you know, I'm blessed. You know, just, just keep putting my faith in God. And, I mean, let, let, letting whatever happens happen. You know, I can't control what the teams do. I can't control what they like. I can't control what they don't like. All I control is my reaction to it and how I continue to move forward. So, I mean, Earth hit it right on the head. I mean, I just got to keep doing me, keep putting my faith in God, and then everything that is going to happen is going to happen. There's something pretty amazing that's happening today, and I'm going to shout it out since I've covered this team for now. Officially, this is my 10th year, a decade with this team. You're flying out to this place called Jacksonville. And yeah. I think I could tell you every flight number, probably every flight time, and every flight scenario for Jacksonville having having flown back and forth in recent history here. You're going to have an opportunity to see the facility and to be around former Syracuse head coach Doug Marone, former Syracuse player Tom Coughlin, former Syracuse offensive coordinator, coordinator Nate Hackett, former Syracuse running backs coach Tyrone Wheatley. So there's definitely a connection down there. What can you say about the Jacksonville invite and opportunity? You're not working out. You're just meeting the coaches and seeing the facility. Bring me into the experience and, and what's to come as you will step into Everbank Field, and you're going to have to take a picture because we've walked, we'll have walked the same path after you do that today. 
Um, you know, it's, it's very excited. Uh, I haven't had a chance to really talk with the Jaguars as much as every, all the other teams that have reached out. And, um, just because it was understood that I was going to have an opportunity to go to their place and meet them all face-to-face and look them in the eye straight to hand. So definitely really excited to be able to, you know, get out there, maybe talk some football, you know, explain to them who I am and get to know them as well. Um, so, you know, I was really excited. I'm actually happy to get, I get to go to a little bit warm weather. I heard it's raining in Jacksonville, though, but I'll, t- I'll take 60 degrees any day. I will, I will tell you, I'll tell you right now, since I got them on my phone all the time because of my travel. So I will tell you where Jacksonville's at in this moment in time. Let's see. Jacksonville is 67. It's going to be cloudy today with with a chance of rain this afternoon and maybe thunderstorms. But are you hanging out? Are you are you just staying today? Or are you hanging out a couple of days? Because it's going to go back to the 70s. Oh, uh, well, I'm flying in today. I leave tomorrow evening. Okay. All right. Well, you'll at least be able to get up and get some nice weather. What I can promise you about Jacksonville, Zaire, is that they don't have snow. <laughs> That's good with me, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, I mean, what's that been like for you? I told my wife, my wife's birthday is April 5th. And I told her, I said, I got a feel. I've been telling her for months. I was like, I got this feeling we're going to get snow in April. And on I her birthday. I knew, I knew it was snow. I literally said to myself, it was warm. And I'm like, we're due for one more. I don't know when it's going to come, <laughs> but I knew it was going to get one more. So, yeah, well, it be- was just, I knew it was coming. Being in the business of, you know, being a broadcaster and a writer, that, you know, I make predictions. And, and I, you know, I try to. I, I do my research and and I estimate what I think you know might happen here, there, wherever. So I'm in the business of doing the research and having a having an hypothesis. And in that case, with the weather, I said to my wife, I was like, "This is another prediction I got right." And she stopped and she turned and looked at me with the nicest of faces and she said, "Are you proud of yourself?" And I said, "Yeah, I am." <laughs> <laughs> You gotta oh, take man. you gotta take the percentages. Right now, my percentages over a fifteen year career are very good, and I predict the weather better than most meteorologists. So I think I'm in good shape. <laughs> Maybe you should switch to weather. <laughs> yeah, listen, man, I like this job too much. I don't know if I can switch to weather, but but I and I wouldn't have met people like yourself if I was a meteorologist. You know, maybe because it seems like you can put your, you know, lick your finger, put it in the sky, and you knew it was going to snow too. So, oh man, it's a backup plan for you and I. When we retire in our sixties, sixties, seventies, we'll go be meteorologists somewhere, and we'll tell everybody what it, when it's going to snow in Syracuse. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. <laughs> but before I let you go, Zaire, I want to I want to discuss with you. Uh, you you and I are going to be doing an event with Jonathan Thomas and Irv Phillips. And we're going to have the opportunity of, of hanging out. You're all working out for the Bills on Friday the 13th. And then you're all hanging out with me on Sunday, April 15th at 2 p.m. at the Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York on 3680 Milton Avenue. And we're going to be able to say what's up to the fans one more time, sign a few autographs, take a few pictures, talk to the fans, just what it means to you to get back out there. I've made it a point over the years to – give these opportunities that I, I don't feel like are given for guys like yourself, like Jonathan, like Irv, to see everybody, to thank everyone once again, and to put your put yourselves out there to get some more publicity, and, and hopefully you never know who's listening and, and who's watching. So what does it mean to you to be able to do this event and have another opportunity to be in Syracuse and be around the community again? Um, you know, it always means something. You know, Syracuse fans uh... – you know, have supported us, you know, through my four years here. You know, even though it wasn't always pretty, you know, they always showed up. And, you know, we, we had some great moments together. We, we cried, we laughed, and we, you know, we experienced it all together. So it always means something just to be able to get to see them one last time. And to, to have that with the fans and have the opportunity to see them one more time, what what can you say about your time at Syracuse? Because, I mean, we're going to talk about this more extensively at at the event on Sunday, but you have gone through different defenses, different schemes, and, and different things. I mean, I would venture, and, and I want to go a little bit deeper with this with, with you on Sunday, but just to kind of dive into it as, as a little kind of taste test, Schaefer's defense was all about attacking, was all about striking, was all about taking you at the as the middle linebacker and involving you 
all over the place and getting you ready. Dino Babers' defense feels a little bit different, looks a little bit different. Did you feel like it was a drastic change to your game? What can you say about the defense? Because we know what Schaefer does, and we know Diener, D- Dino's feel is a little bit different. It's a little bit more read and react at times, it feels like. But how did you experience it, being the middle linebacker and, and being the quarterback of the defense, so to speak? Um, for me, I just took it as an exciting challenge. Uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I I'm, I'm a person who just kind of loves the game, loves learning it from different perspectives. So, um, you know, when Coach Babers got here and they often they offered a, a new, um, you know, kind of system, uh, I just took it the bull by the horns and you know took it as an opportunity to just expand my football knowledge. Do you feel like it changed kind of your nature a little bit as an attacker? Did did it? Did it make you kind? Of, did you feel like you had to fight yourself at all, as far as you wanting to go straight forward? But in this defense, maybe I'm I'm going to this place and I'm going over here as opposed to right at the quarterback. I mean, how did you how did you kind of experience it? Did it make you change your personal game at all? Um, I mean, in a sense, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was it was a lot less like aggressive, but, um, we still, you know, got after it sometimes. Um, I think, uh, coach Babers, you know, coach Ward, they understood the type of players that we had and the mentality was coming from, and they did their best to, you know, play to our strengths. And, you know, the reason why, you know, coach Schaefer recruited is all to be, you know, attack aggressives and attackers. Um, so he wouldn't just come in and just, I mean, we, what well, we weren't just sitting on our heels the whole time. Um, you know, we, we got after it as well, a lot as well, so just not as much as with Coach Shafe. So, I mean, it was definitely an adjustment, um, but I think it just came. I don't think I changed my game. I think it just matured in a sense where I understood how to kind of play with more patience and um, kind of see what and know exactly what I was looking at rather than just uh, when I was a younger player just kind of flying around. That coming from Zaire Franklin. There will be plenty more this Sunday, April 15th at 2 p.m. at the Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus. Very excited on what we're going to be discussing and fresh off of the opportunity that Zaire will have with the Buffalo Bills to show his talents and do what he has to do. Zaire, I'm telling you right now, you and I will see each other on Sunday, but I better have some pictures sent to my phone of Jacksonville today is all I'm saying. (laughs) I'll see what I can do, boss. All right, man. Well, listen, be good. Thank you for always, you know, taking the time and, and thank you for the mutual respect. And I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. I see you soon. All right, take care. Bye. That coming from Zaire Franklin once again. Heading down to Jacksonville today. Dang it all. I'm not heading down to Jacksonville. I'm cold. <laughs> so, so cold. It's so cold outside. We're going to take this. It is. I can't do it. It's too much. I'm ready. You know, I'm ready. I think that this, because people are always like so tired. And everybody's like, why am I tired right now? What am I so tired about? It's the snow. It's the snow and the cold weather. That's why I think that that we get so tired. Because we just, we're done. We've had it. We've had our fill of the snow, and we are ready to move on with our lives. And and the hibernation is over, so to speak. We'll take a step aside for a fast break, and I'll get you all ready for tomorrow's show in just a moment. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. Hi, this is Kira from Looking Glass Events, where we're always giving you a reason to celebrate. Whether you have a small business, large business, personal event, or wedding, we are available to plan and coordinate your dream event to life. Every detail, every step, Looking Glass Events is working with you all the way. Call us at 315-702-4653. That's 315-702-4653. Or contact us through our website, lgweddingsandevents.com. Looking Glass Events giving you a reason to celebrate. The Penn & Trophy Center on 111 East Willow Street in Syracuse, New York, has been making memories for Central New York for over 60 years. It has the trophies for your teams, and when you walk in there, it's so much more than just that. When you walk into the Penn & Trophy Center, you are immersed in the reality that 
anything can be customized, anything can be engraved, whether it's for your anniversary, your wedding, your bar mitzvah, your birthday party, whatever you want to do with that memory, that watch from grandpa, or that bracelet from mom, or that wedding ring that's been passed down through your family. If you want to get something engraved with a memory to last a lifetime, the Penn and Trophy Center, 111 East Willow Street in Syracuse, New York, where memories are made and where memories last a lifetime. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Proud to be here with you every single Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. want to thank you for spending some time with the show every Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 Eastern Time in the morning. And you are on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. If you haven't become a member, please make sure you do so. Becoming a member connects you to the show all the time. Every time we go live, you get sent an email. All you got to do is open the email, become a member, and, and once you're a member... You open the email, it says, would you like to listen? You click on yes, you're good to go. Only members get that email, and only members can chat with me in the live chat room. I want to thank all the support that we have had over the weeks, the months, the years, and all this time. And now I know at least that Zaire Franklin and I have a retirement plan together to be meteorologists. So so it's good. It's fun. Something to look forward to. I want to thank Zaire Franklin for being a part of the show. I want to thank Irv Phillips as well. And I want to thank O'Shea Brissett again. I know we played back the conversation that I had with him that kind of more or less solidified for me that he was coming back right after they had lost in Omaha to Duke. And so I want to thank him again for taking some time with me. Coming up on tomorrow's show, very excited for this. We're going to head back to Q's camp with some live interviews, this time with the offense, God willing. We'll get that set up in the first hour of the show. And then at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, I'll be joined by Jonathan Thomas, the third part of the trifecta that'll be working out for the Buffalo Bills this Friday and then hanging out with you this Saturday, April 15th at 2 p.m. at the Wildcat Sports Pub. Come out and see us. Jonathan Thomas will join the show tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, Tuesday, April 10th. And then the ingredients to success will round out the show, as they always do, at 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time, right around the end of the show, proudly presented by Utica Pizza Company, where you should go get the chicken riggy pizza right now for lunch. 628 South Main Street in North Syracuse, New York right by the Sweetheart Corners. So very excited to bring you those conversations tomorrow and so much more as the world is ever-changing in sports. Very excited to talk with you. Make sure that you connect with me 24-7 on Facebook at WakeUpCallDT, on Twitter at CallDT, and on Instagram at WakeUpCall underscore DT. You can also go to where everything is at, WakeUpCallDT.com. That will be the MixLR live feed embedded right there on the homepage. You'll also find the RSS feed, the iTunes podcast, and the downloadable app powered by Podbean. We're also proud to be on Player FM and TuneIn Radio. So many different ways to listen to Wake Up Call that now has over 950 broadcasts available to you and has been downloaded almost 102,000 show downloads up to this point. Thank you so much for the love. Thank you for the appreciation. And beyond all the numbers and beyond all the busyness of life, Thank you to God. Thank you to good relationships, good people. And when you are a good person, you believe in God, you work your butt off, and you do the best you can. I can always say that good things have come from that. 
And if anything, today, Zaire and Irv reminded me of the things that I've forgotten in life. Thank you so much for putting the back burner on the front burner and reminding me what it means to be in this world. God bless to Irv, God bless to Zaire, and God bless to you. I'll talk with you tomorrow on the show.